the world itself is turning around saying they don't want GM. So the government's committed to itself to a pathway that doesn't leave them a lot of room to manoeuvre. Essentially, the moratorium that we have in place now can be dropped, but it has to be replaced by a law that protects GE-free production and protects our GE-free environment. And as you know, only recently there was a Colmar Brunton survey that showed that 80% of New Zealanders support that path. So I think we should look to the government to take that lead from the people and actually follow that path, a five-year moratorium at least, and certainly a directionally a vision for a G-free New Zealand in food and environment. And, and what happens if they don't, John? Well, I think eventually they will do, because the reality is the whole world is going towards that pathway. And this clash is a clash of a global nature that is really between big business and farmers, communities, people, mums, dads, even politicians. The way you shop is a political act. Understand that buying it is buying in. 80% of food purchasing decisions are made by women. Mothers, aunties, grandmothers, girlfriends, daughters, sisters. Use your purse power. For example, do not buy Nestle. Do not buy First Choice, Kellogg's, No Frills. Do not buy Pam's or Ingham's chickens. Do not buy Carry Care infant formula for your babies. Support the businesses who make a commitment to being GE free and boycott those who don't. Educate your families, communities and yourselves about issues surrounding GE in order that you can make informed choice about your future so that you can make informed choices for your children. If we have choice, it means as a fader company we will have GE free, and we will have GE products to either choose or not. Uh, could you explain this please? I mean GE is in our food. We're eating it. Uh, what our strategy to, do, uh, to deal with that is we would like to create with some, hopefully some sponsorship from a major food company is create the Madge badge, almost like the Heart Foundation tick. So on every product, it is really clear for every woman in a supermarket to see that pink little badge and go, that's the Madge badge, I can buy that. I can buy that. I don't need to make sense of what 404 stabiliser, 244, you know, we are not, you know. It's got, it's got the, we're not scientists. It's got the Madge badge on it. We know it's safe to eat, and that's that about our consumer choice. Things that got me into this movement was absolute frustration every time I went to the supermarket and I knew that there were genetically modified, genetically engineered ingredients in our food but I didn't really understand the science and the labels and I felt frustration that every time I went to buy food for my family that I, I just about needed to be a food science technologist to be able to make the right choice. And you know that frustration stays with me today as I'm sure it does for many of you. And so I think when you do write to uh, members of parliament and particularly to Helen Clark, make the point that you, know, you have the right to make that choice not to eat genetically engineered food. Because let's face it, they have not proved that it's safe we know that from the studies that are coming out from overseas that there are risks associated with this food. So when you make your points to people like Helen Clark, make those points. So, you know, I want to know that the food I'm eating is safe. Prove it. So the reality is that it's just a matter of time between some disaster happening through GM that calls the whole world to account. And, um, and moderating the way they are trying to impose this technology. Contamination into the soil. That's probably one of the best questions because one of the things that we are absolutely certain about is that we know next to nothing about things that live in soil. It's like trying to describe an African jungle 
by describing just one organism. That is the extent of our knowledge of what's happening in the soil. So there is a vast range of possibilities of transfer of genetically modified DNA in the soil, um, soil systems. It, that alone should be enough to make us pause from releasing these materials. The independent review of Irma recently reported that Irma has a tendency and a preference for the applicant's evidence. That is a really significant concern for all of us. It is also clear from our involvement in the MAGE case that Irma is prepared to go beyond the public hearing and submission process to further negotiate with applicants in order to ensure their applications are granted and they're successful. This is what happened in the Ag Research case. There was no opportunity given to the public at that time to make further submissions on the renegotiated terms. And I think that presents a significant threat to the integrity of the whole judicial process in these cases. It is also true that anyone opposing submissions in general is at a significant disadvantage through lack of funding and resources to challenge applications like this. But without that opposition, New Zealanders can, in my opinion, have no confidence whatsoever that Irma has any chance of getting it right on their own. As a scientist, can very much understand the wish of a scientific group to gain a commercial return from the work that they have done. And traditionally, this is achieved through the mechanism of a patent. So that's the first point. The second point is that most organisms have a history, at least of association, with different groups of human beings. And where we have examples overseas, where a Western nation and a company in a Western nation is applying patents to species that have had an association with other groups of human beings in some other part of the world, then clearly that is immoral and wrong because somebody is attempting to take part of the traditional um, associations, the traditional cultural property of another group. So that's clearly wrong. So, somewhere perhaps we need to develop new methods of ensuring that good scientific work and commercial applications can flow back to the original group without something as draconian as saying, I patent this organism and therefore to insist on some form of ownership over something that's living. What's going to defeat it is the economic argument. The economic argument, a disaster that actually causes some deaths that people can see, rather than subclinical effects, a whole range of different things could happen. And unfortunately, the aim now is to make sure those things don't happen, that we actually have in place a precautionary principle approach, which is ethical applications of a very powerful technology, but not forcing it on the public, not forcing it on the environment, not forcing it on the poor of the world. So you can choose which agreement you comply with. You can comply with the World Trade Organization and have to prove that GM foods are unsafe, or you can comply with the Cartagena Protocol, but if you do, then you're going to have trade sanctions awarded against you. So essentially, the US said that they were going to try and get the Europeans' ban declared in breach of the WTO so that the US could use trade sanctions against the Europeans to force open its agriculture markets, but also to get a precedent-setting ruling that GM bans internationally were contrary to world trade rules and that any country that implemented a ban on GMOs could be subject to trade sanctions. It is a matter of very considerable shame that four governments, plus ours, joined with the US in bringing the complaint. Egypt, Argentina, Canada, and Australia. So far, Egypt has pulled out. Canada and Argentina are rethinking 
and we in Tweedledee across the Tasman <laughs> are the ones in there backing the UES. Our government, and in particular Mr Sutton, justify this on the basis that the sanitary and phytosanitary agreement is fundamental to the protection of New Zealand's biosecurity. <laughs> In addition, it is fundamentally important for our agricultural products to be able to get into other countries that there aren't false claims <coughs> made against the risks that our products may pose for their uh, systems of production. And of course the fire blight issue in Australia is the um, long running one in relation to apples. And so Jim Sutton said, this is a consistent position for support of the sanitary and phytosanitary agreement. It's not actually really about our position on GM. <laughs> but it also, of course, puts the question on the table about contradictions between New Zealand's own moratorium and its position on the SPS agreement at the World Trade Organization. And were New Zealand to continue and renew and extend and make permanent a moratorium, it would in fact be contradicting the position that it is supporting being put forward at the WTO. And indeed, New Zealand is already on record as having rejected at the WTO an eco-labelling proposal from the EU, which is the one that the EU is now putting in place. It sees that as a mechanism for protectionism. The appropriate place to address biosafety issues was in the UN system. Now, the US, as we know, doesn't like losing. <laughs> so it's not surprising that especially because of the emergence of the Cartagena Protocol, and indeed it's quite significant date of implementation of September the 11th, <laughs> And the fact that the Cartagena Protocol stands for the precautionary principle, stands for the rights of governments to regulate GMOs, that stands for the rights of southern countries to use the protocol even when they haven't yet got their national systems in place, has got essentially the right to put decisions of the food that we want to eat ahead of the world trade rules, the US is developing a strategy to neutralise the Cartagena Protocol as it comes into effect. And, as I said, the New Zealand government is complicit in this. When it failed to defeat the Cartagena Protocol, the US looked to the World Trade Organisation as the way of neutralising it and making it unworkable. In May this year, the US lodged a complaint at the World Trade Organization against the European Union's effective moratorium against the approval of GMOs. Europe is the largest market, especially for US soy <coughs> products, valued at 1.1 billion US a year. But this is not simply an economic issue for the US. This is a question of whether it is able to set the rules for the production of food internationally. And that for it is what is at stake here. Two weeks ago, the British Retail Consortium representing 90% of Britain's high street stores told agricultural officials they would still refuse to stop GM produce even if farmers were given the green light to grow crops on a commercial scale. Such a response to consumer pressure is heartening. We know GM policy is becoming a strong trend in the world's largest food market. The US is of course backing this with several other strategies. One is to use the issue of food aid. So poor countries like Zambia and Nicaragua are facing a real quandary. They have the dumping of GM food. They desperately need to distribute that food, but they know the risks to their biodiversity of 
uh, releasing it are not only significant in itself, but because it will then mean that they have difficulty in sending uncontaminated crops across into their major markets, in particular in Europe. So it's a backdoor strategy of the Europeans to try and get those poorer countries to put pressure, sorry, the Americans to get the poorer countries to put pressure on the Europeans not to proceed with a strong GMO policy. But we also have a question to ask about what the implications of that position are for the position at home. And whether in fact, by proceeding down the path they are, in supporting a case that may end up with a ruling that says you cannot have moratoria and effective anti-GM labelling, not only are they taking a position that makes it difficult for them to take that political position here, but they are seeking a ruling that will mean that future governments in this country cannot go down that path unless they are prepared to run the risk of serious trade sanctions. So in terms of your campaign strategies, a campaign in terms of the WTO and what the government is doing there is critical because your domestic campaign may be rendered totally meaningless unless we are able to neutralise these developments in the international arena. New Zealand is a signatory, Jane, to the Cartagena Biosafety Protocol. Can you just clarify now that 50 or 51 other countries have ratified that, is it a worthwhile goal to pursue and pressure the government to actually ratify that for New Zealand? And how does any resistance on the part of the government to do that tie in with their support of the US and the WTO and so forth? I, I, Thank you. Th there's, there is a big tension between the multilateral environmental agreements and the multilateral trade agreements. And the problem is the trade agreements have teeth and the environmental agreements don't. But there is, as one of the strategies that's being developed internationally, now a lot of pressure on building counter-instruments and to try and get attached to those counter-instruments clauses that say we will not support trade agreements that have provisions that are contrary to these agreements. So to try and get governments when they sign up to those agreements to commit themselves in a way to a contradiction um, now, our government is very nervous about anything that impacts on the trade agreements. But I think, again, it comes back to that question of confronting them with the contradictions of having been a party to the negotiation of the Cartagena Protocol and of their rhetoric being consistent with it and the fact that they will neutralise the impact of that if they continue uh, taking a path that favours the WTO over the Cartagena Protocol. The only place to put effective pressure is the Prime Minister and her department, ultimately because of the power of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. However, to put pressure on MPs is nevertheless an important way of trying to get them to produce answers. And what we've discovered consistently is that they just get the standard answer prepared by the uh, ministry and, um, and that's it. So persistence is important, but I would think that if, and, and this hasn't been done in this country yet, if there was able to be just a short document put together about what the implications for GM in New Zealand are, both in terms of labelling and a moratorium, and link that to what's happening at the WTO, it could be a very powerful lobbying document. And I don't know whether the Greens have, have uh, been looking at doing something like that, Jeanette. A lot of people were really excited that, about the poll that showed that tooth that, that two-thirds to three-quarters of Labour's own supporters want GE-free food production to remain in New Zealand. And people thought that was good, that it was uh, particularly Labour supporters who wanted GE-free food production um, preserved, and those who didn't want it preserved tended to be national supporters. When you look at what it is that keeps the Labour Party in power, it is actually encroaching on more and more of the National Party's turf. That is where the battle is fought. 
So Helen may well feel that the three quarters of her supporters who don't want the moratorium lifted have got nowhere else to go as long as she can keep slinging bring back brickbats at the Green Party so that they don't go there. They've actually got nowhere else they can go and it'll enable her to capture more and more of national supporters, which is what keeps her in power by, by colonising the middle ground. Now that is actually how politics works. I've been thinking for a long time now about what would allow her to change position and save face, because I know that is essential and it's quite hard to come up with a, an answer, but it certainly isn't going to be a complete um, about turn on the existing moratorium. Even if it were something to have a similar effect, there's got to be another way of packaging it so that she is not seen to have done a complete about turn. Isn't it a bit like nuclear thing where once it gets out, it's too late? Well, I actually make the comparison, if your house is on fire and it's the kitchen burning, you don't let the whole house go. They've, they've basically ruined three or four crops in five or six countries. The, the rest of the world in the main is GM free and that's the way it should remain. So you, you don't think that it's too late after October for something to happen? It's never too late. They can release one crop and another crop. Eventually they will learn that what we are doing is an unethical experiment on nature and on people. And as that, and, and they tried to suppress it five years ago. The, the, the cat's out of the bag, people know about it, and now it's a matter of how are we going to regulate it. Is this having an, an effect on people's attitudes towards corporate corporations? I'm not sure it is, because some of the biggest corporations in the world are actually opposing GE food. If you actually talk to McDonald's, if you actually talk to some of these big companies, the vast majority of them don't want to buy of it either. So the reality is that they've actually got a split within the corporate world itself. I think there's companies that are exporting food that are waking up to it and saying, hang on, we don't want to, uh, our exports upset. So they're the ones that are also waking up. They know what it's like in the markets overseas and that nobody overseas wants GM. The organics movement stands to lose a lot, but it's not just the organics movement, it's the whole of non-GM agriculture stands to lose. It's just that the organic movement's been at the cutting edge and are the ones that are most concerned with the purity of food. But once GM's out, it won't affect just organics, it'll f affect everything. Are there any substantial companies uh, involved? I think you find companies like Heinz Watty and Zespri they, they both won't want um, GM in their, in their food, otherwise they won't have the market for it. But is, is, um, is uh, organic food a significant part of their business? No, it's generally a smaller part of their business. Um, but they still won't want to jeopardise that, that part because it's an important growing part of their business. Although you're a New Zealand company, are you... Uh, you're not immune to what's going on overseas, are you? Oh, definitely not. Uh, we import from other countries, we import from America where the contamination is uh, widespread. And I know the companies there we deal with are having a very difficult time. They're, they're really struggling to make sure that the ingredients they get for their food is, is GE free. And it started a regime of testing uh, which is pushing the price up, but then of course there's also been contamination going into food lines and they can't prevent it. No matter what they say, it's getting mixed in. They, they must gaze and in, in, in envy at New Zealand. I think we have a wonderful reputation of being clean and green and that's a real shame that we're going to lose that. Real shame. It wouldn't just be a shame, wouldn't it be an extremely expensive uh, loss to the country as a whole? It would be, be a disaster for our um, trade. We wouldn't, our food, our agricultural commodities, which are the bulk of our exports, would suffer. You must feel very badly let down by the, uh, the, the government in New Zealand over this issue. I don't think the government's um, awake to what's really happening to it in agriculture. I think it's more concerned with world trade and issues around world trade, but they're not concerned about what's going to happen to the New Zealand farmer. 
Well, that's a, that's a democratic... Um, that's a failing of democracy, surely? Yes, it is on one hand, but I think on the other hand it's... Um, I think it's political games. So, it, it's hard to believe that the government is pursuing this. I mean, it, just speculating, can you think of a reason why the, the government might want to con lift this moratorium despite all this obvious facts? I think it gets down to um, being in the World Trade Organization.